help help Savan mute myself. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to our evening talk this evening um, by Surrey Wildlife Trust. Um, tonight we will be uh, talking about the Purbright Red Deer project um, and the amazing success uh, that we've had on the ground. But I'll leave that to the experts uh, to give you that uh, enlightening information. Um, just a few housekeeping um, things this evening. Uh, we will be recording this. Um, due to popular demand, uh, many of our members um, are unable to sort of make the evening event. So we will be putting this on our online talk page at a later date. Um, so if you wish to remain anonymous while asking questions, um, please use the Q&A function. For those of you who are new to Zoom, um, the Q&A function is at the bottom of your screen, the, right across there is a black bar and there is a Q&A function. You just click on that and it will open up a box uh, which you type your answer and then uh, myself, James and Steve will see that and answer it at the appropriate time. Um, if you wish to um, ask a question in person and can't see the Q&A function, simply raise your virtual hand. Um, unfortunately, we can't see you uh, during webinars, so no waving at the screen, unfortunately. Um, there, down again at the bottom of the bar should be a raise hand function. Um, so just raise your hand and we will try and get back to you um, for that. Um, so without um, Without further delay, I'm going to pass over to James Adler, and I hope you'll have a wonderful, enjoyable evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Sophie, can you just tell me you can hear me okay? I can. Perfect. Thank you, James. Thank you. So just a quick thank you to Sophie. She is our technical whiz. She set this all up. She's going to make sure this <laughs> the wheels stay on this virtual bus. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce Steve as well, who's the farm manager for Surrey Wildlife Trust. He looks after our herds of cattle, deer and sheep. Um, and I'm James Adler, I'm Director of Biodiversity. I look after uh, the 7,500 hectares that the Wildlife Trust manages, which is about 4% of the county. I can't tell you how excited Steve and I are to give you this talk this evening. Um, it's one that we've actually been really looking forward to. Um, this is the one place that we cannot take you, whether there's a pandemic or not. We're not allowed to take you into the 740 hectares or Purbright Ranges. And before lockdown, we didn't even know that we could give virtual talks like this. So it's a real opportunity for us to show you in a, in a way that we haven't been able to before, one of the most special wildlife areas in the south of England. What I should do though, is just give you a quick warning. It is a live and active project with wild animals involved. The animals are free to have an incredible existence, very natural existence, free from pressures from dogs and disturbance. They are also free to breed freely. And that means that we do have to act to control and manage their numbers. Steve is going to talk a little bit about that more further on. You're not going to see any graphic images, anything like that at all. But it is important that you're aware that this project does mean that we have to manage the numbers of the animals on this site. So having got those, my own housekeeping rules out of the way, let me talk to you about this incredible project. Um, Red deer are an incredible animal, and Steve will talk more about them further on. But this is the sort of landscape that we are talking about. But before we get too much into deer, why on earth have we even got a deer project? What is this place? What is Heathland? Why is it special? This is an aerial photograph looking across Purbright Ranges. So you are looking towards Woking and towards Guildford in this picture. And for those of you who know the area well, uh, the road in the foreground is the Maltway, and this is the start of, of Camberley up here on the hill. The ranges you can see down to the, to the top, right, uh, top right hand side of the screen is the National Rifle Association ranges at Bisley. So you can see this huge swathe of wild habitat here in front of us. And there's been no public access in there since the 1970s. And this is the area that we're talking about. But what is Heathland and why is it special? Well, everything in purple on this map is the only climatic area in the world that supports lowland European heathland. So you can see that the UK can support it, uh, the top of the Iberian Peninsula, Northern France, Denmark, and just around the tip of Scandinavia. That's the only place where the weather is right for lowland heathland. You've then got to think about soils as well. Please don't feel you've got to read everything on the right hand side of this. Look at the picture. This is a very typical heathland soil. So you've got the gray material at the top, that's where all of the nutrients have been washed out. 
And then you've got the natural sands underneath where they've been enriched and where the material is washed down. What it means is it's an incredibly impoverished soil. So it's hard for things to grow there. And we therefore get specialized vegetation and actually specialized animals that are attracted to that. This is how Heathland was created. Um, there was a native forest fairly extensively, although unlikely to have been covering everything 6,000 years ago. People came in, they cleared the forest, they grazed the area, the sandy soils meant that the nutrients washed out and therefore we had heathland. As animals started to disappear, as the agricultural revolution came in, things started to become aforested again. Some of that was deliberate, some of it was from scrub and heathland was abandoned. Much of it was built on, much of it was turned over to other types of agriculture, much of it was turned into horse pasture. And actually it's only recently in the last 30, 40 years that we've started to do major heath heathland restoration, especially in Surrey. And the rates of decline have been quite terrifying. In Surrey alone, we've lost 85% of our heathland habitat in the last 200 years. So this is another picture looking into Purbright, but what is heathland? It is the right soil type, the right climate, what's happened in the past, and all of those things allow some incredible species to appear. And Purbright is a really good example of this. If you go out there at the right time of year, there are thousands and thousands of heads of orchids flowering at the same time. It is spectacular. You can go out onto Chobham Common, you can go out onto Ash Ranges. Both of those are good, but I'm afraid they're not quite as good as on Purbright, where it's undisturbed. There is an incredible profusion of flowering orchids at the right time of year. But for many of you, you might think that Heathland is just covered in heather common heather, ling, Coluna vulgaris, whatever you want to call it. And this is very much a quintessential heathland picture with end of August, beginning of September with um, heather all in flower. But heathland is, is much, much more than this. And actually what Purbright is very famous for is its giant mire systems. There are five very wet areas, big bogs within the middle of Purbright, which have large areas of open water, lots of grasses, lots of sedges, lots of rushes, lots of orchids. Uh, cotton grass, as you can see in the foreground of this picture, and a whole range of other things as well. And some of them are really very special. Um, these are heathland species, so they're not all found on purbrites. You've got cow wheat in the top left-hand corner. You've got marsh gentians. The only ones of those are found on Chobham Common. Uh, they're a, a beautiful flower, and that's the only place in Surrey that you can find them. And actually on Chobham, you've got the Deptford pink as well, which is one of the rarest plants in the entire country. There are only 30 places in the United Kingdom where you find Deptford Pinks and they're on Chobham Common. But we've got some things that are a bit more regular across Heathland but are quite special in their own way. We've got um, marsh club moss on the left hand side. Um, I won't wax lyrical too much about that because for many of you you'll think it's um, possibly a bit boring but it's incredibly rare and needs a little bit of disturbance to thrive. Down in the bottom right hand corner we've got marsh fern that's unbelievably rare found in some of the woodland areas and it's thriving on purbright in some of the native woodland areas on the site. And then more commonly, and many of you will recognize this, we've got sundews in the top right hand corner. This is round leaf sundew. And those droplets are not dew, they are droplets of enzymes and they serve several functions. They attract insects onto the leaf, they then immediately start to dissolve the insect that has landed and then the leaf elongates around it and the plant takes extra nutrients from the insect because the soils are so poor. So it uses the nutrients to supplement its diet and thrive. Heathland is not just about plants though. It is one of the most diverse habitats for invertebrates and it's one of the most famous for spider species. Chobham Common has the largest number of spider records anywhere in the country. Around 400 species have been recorded there. And you can see this on a, on a damp and misty day, all of the webs show up. Um, and it's really quite incredible. You begin to realize that the sheer volume of invertebrate life, even with the massive declines in invertebrates that we're seeing at the moment. And some of these really are very, very special indeed. This is the lynx spider, which is found all over Purbright ranges. But if you look on the map, you can see the records for the spider are really only in the Thames Basin Heath, where we are here in, in Surrey, around Guildford and, and Woking. Um, there was one historic record down in Dorset, but never recorded since. So sometimes we don't think that Surrey has any endemic or very special species. This is one which proves that a bit wrong. 
And we've also got some things that, um, yeah, maybe I should have put the health warning in at the beginning about the number of um, spider pictures I was going to put up. Uh, but this is the raft spider, which is one of our biggest native spiders. This is so large that it can actually catch fish. And this is it having caught a stickleback. Um, so they are the equivalent of the, the bird eating spiders in the tropics. And they rest on the surface tension and then able to break it, dive down underneath the water and hunt effectively to catch prey items of this size. And they will drag them out onto the edge um, so that they can eat them. It's not just those. We've got a whole other range of things that are out there. You've got some um, heather crab spiders eating a bumblebee and you can si see the size disparity that's happened there. We've got really good colonies of glowworms still out on Purbright Ranges as well, because there's a real lack of light pollution out on the site and the damp, wet areas really suit this declining species. But let's not pretend that Heathland is um, a pleasant place to be if you are a caterpillar or a small invertebrate. Uh, what is happening here is that this wood wasp has caught a, a clouded drab moth caterpillar. It has anaesthetized it is taking it down underneath the ground where it will lay an egg on it. And then when that egg hatches out, the wasp larva will have a live food supply. Um, so it can be quite gruesome if you're a, a small animal existing out there. But what's really interesting is how different species have evolved to cope with this. This is the silver studded blue uh, butterfly. This is the male. They are tiny, but they're very, very beautiful. But when scientists have been looking at the caterpillars of this species, they find that hardly any of them are parasitized. Whereas for clouded, drab, clouded drab moth caterpillars, they can find that it can be 80, 90% are parasitized, they're taken away by the wasps. The reason that the silver studded blue does so incredibly well is that they have formed a symbiotic relationship with ant species. And this is really hard. This is one of the hardest pictures to take um, on our Heathen sites. This is a silver studded blue caterpillar being herded by black ants. And what happens is that the ants all hover over the egg while it's waiting to be hatched. As soon as it hatches out, they carry the caterpillar underneath the ground to look after it. They bring it up at night. It grazes out on young heather. They look after it through the night and then they take it back underneath the ground so it's protected. So the, the caterpillar gets a whole load of protection. And in return, the ants massage it and it releases amino acids and sugars from pores in its bodies, which the ants absolutely love. And they, they get those on their antennae and they pull them through their mandibles and, and lick off those sugars uh, like, a, like a lollipop. Uh, so it's an incredible symbiotic relationship which has delivered, delivered itself over millions of years. Heathland has more types of dragonfly and damselfly than any other UK habitat. Um, this is taken by one of our photography winners a couple of years ago. It's an incredible picture of a damselfly up front and you can see the individual facets on each, each eye on either side. Um, they have more um, individual facets in an eye than any other insect species. Um, they've actually got three more simple eyes in between the two big ones, which allows them to judge roll and pitch. But some of these are a huge species. This is the, the golden ring dragonfly, uh, which really thrives on heathland uh, and gravel lined streams that run through it. But all of these things need clean water, a lack of disturbance and just the right vegetation. And then we get into the bigger species. We get into lizards and snakes. And Heathland is one of the very few habitats that supports all six native British reptiles. So that's the three lizard species in common lizard, um, slow worm and sand lizard, and the three snake species, which are the adder, our only venomous snake, a grass snake, and the smooth snake. And this is the smooth snake. This is the one that very few people have seen. It's not venomous. Um, it's only on a couple of sites in Surrey and Dorset. It's really incredibly rare. Um, unfortunately, it's not on Purbright. I'll explain why a little bit later on, but it is still on some of the other big army sites. And you can really tell the difference. Um, it doesn't have a red eye compared to the adder. It's got a round pupil rather than a slit through its pupil. And the um, diamond pattern running down its back is very different. But the thing that really sets this site apart along with the other Thames Basin heaths is it's important for three very special bird species. And these are them. So in the top right hand corner, you've got the woodlark. And then in the bottom, uh, right hand corner, you've got the Dartford Warbler, and then the last one is the Nightjar. The Nightjar flies to us from Southern Africa. The other two are resident species. These figures in the top left hand corner is how much of the UK population the Thames Basin Heath held for these bird species in 2005. So 30% of the UK population of Dartford Warblers 
were around the sites that the what the Hampshire Wildlife Trust and Surrey Wildlife Trust manage. It's really incredible when you think about it. And 10% of the woodlark population and 8% of the nightjar population. It's not just them. There's a, a, a really great bird assemblage out there from stone chats, which is what we have on the left, to red starts, which again fly in from Africa or on the right hand side. We're also very lucky. We get overwintering great grey shrike. We get overwintering hen harrier from time to time. Things like ring ouzel on migration all move through the site. So some absolutely incredible bird species that come through. So with all of that in mind, and bear in mind, I'm probably preaching to the converted in, in people who think that wildlife is really important. Why on earth is Heathland in trouble? Well, this is a, a, an old picture taking around um, 1900, 1910, looking into Purbright um, from Chobham Ridges. So up, not far away from where that initial picture was that I showed you. If you look, you really only got one big tree in the foreground, just a little bit of bracken and mainly heather. And nearly all of this is from grazing pressure, from the number of animals that would have been out there grazing the heather, grazing the heath, but there would have been other activities with people taking firewood, using wood and materials for other purposes as well. So we're very much um, an industrial landscape, uh, but with heather and the other species promoted because of that. We've lost a lot of heathland because of these reasons. We don't have farmers, especially in Surrey, in the same way. And the ones that we do absolutely don't graze the heaths in the same way that we do anymore. It's not economically viable for them. So losing those animals is a real issue when it comes to heathland management. And the farms that we have left, as I say, have become much more intensive, much more profit driven. It's the way that they've had to go to survive. You know, think about how often as you drive around, especially north, northwest Surrey, how often you actually see livestock these days. The real death knoll though for heathland was myxomatosis, the introduction of a fatal disease into the rabbit population in the 1950s. And they really were our last animals left that were grazing our heaths and our chalk grasslands in good numbers. And the wiping out of that species just saw all sorts of things change. And then fundamentally, people didn't care about heathland. Hardy writes about blasted heath. People thought that they were miserable landscapes, very, very unpleasant, cold, full of insects, damp, in the past full of highwaymen as well. So people just didn't value heathland in the same way. And all of those things lead to the problems that you see in this picture. Nearly all the species that I showed you earlier on rely on hot ground temperatures, bare ground. What you can see in this picture, and this is before we introduce the deer, is how high that grass sward is up on these three people. It's above their waist. And in the background, you can see the scrub that's marching down the hillside and taking over from the heather. So all of these things are indicators that the heathland is going backwards and it's trying to convert itself into woodland. And we are trying to promote a human produced landscape in this. This is, this is not a, a natural process. Heathland is a successional habitat. Normally it would try and turn into woodland, but because it's so rare, we take these management interventions. This really tries to show you how much heathland we've lost. So this, for those of you who know it, is Wisley and Ockham Commons. Um, so at the far left hand side of this picture, you would have RHS Wisley Gardens. Everything that's pink in this picture was Heathland in 1948. This is 1971 and you can see the map has gone green. Some of that is from scrub, some of it is from natural colonisation of, of trees, but a lot of it is from deliberate planting of Scots pine trees and lodgepole pine onto the Heathland areas in the intervening years. And then you've got the real problems coming in in the 19, 1960s and indeed into the 1980s, where the A3 and the M25, well, one was widened and one was created. And this was the last stretch of the M25 that was put in in the late 1980s. And you can see it splits the site, causing fragmentation problems and meaning that species can't move from quarter to quarter of the site. Heathland was really starting to be recognised as a very valuable habitat at the Earth Summit in, in around 1990. Um, and international targets started to come in for nature conservation around that time. Think about how recent that is that we've really had binding international targets. And the County Council started to put in some work of felling trees and opening up heathland areas. And you can see the pink areas are starting to just get a little bit larger. By 2007, the Wildlife Trust had taken on the management of the County Council estate, and we started to fell trees. And really do note that I use that term deliberately. We were felling trees to put habitat back in. It is a question of the right tree in the right place. It's not about planting trees on every open habitat in the country. We've really opened up some of these heathland areas to the extent that this is where we are now. 
when we brought our tree felling program at that stage to an end in 2011. And you can see we've gone some way to restoring heath and habitat across this site. And just showing you the rates of decline, again, the silver studded blue, this is where it was before myxomatosis in the 1960s, really common throughout Southeast England and all the way through um, Cornwall and parts of Devon, all the way up into Scotland and actually relatively common through the Midlands. After myxomatosis, it is extinct in Scotland. It is extinct throughout large parts of its habitat. We only have 14 colonies left in Surrey. And this is a species that can only move at roughly 150 meters from where it is born. So if a site is cut off, it can't move to colonize another one. So these are the real problems that we face as conservationists when we're looking after these rare and protected species. And all of the heathen that we have left now would fit on the Isle of Man. So everything in purple on this map is heathland. They've had to make all of those areas bigger so that they can actually see them. If they were the real size, they would all fit on the Isle of Man. So the UK has 20% of the world's resource of lowland heathland. And Surrey Wildlife Trust looks after about 1% of the world resource of heathland, which is quite remarkable. On other sites, we're able to use a whole range of other management techniques from tree felling, we use tractors to manage the heather sward. We use volunteers, and I'm sure many of you vol have volunteered with us to cut down encroaching scrub. We do bare ground creation, whether that's working with golf courses as some of our partners or doing it ourselves. And we've tried control burning as well on different sites. This is just showing you some of the scale of the works that we have to do on some of our Heathton sites. This is uh, working on ash ranges um, about 10 years ago now, clearing scrub out of one of the bog systems. This is a before picture showing all of the scrub that is encroached on the Heathland site. This is two weeks later. We have managed to remove all of that encroaching scrub off this site. I'll just go back one, then show it to you again. This is the scale of the works that we were having to undertake at that time to restore some of the Heathland habitats that have been lost. And what's incredible is that species that have come back on these areas. So it shows that we can make quick and rapid change if we have the ability to do so and the resources to do so. This is just an example of some of the bare ground we put in place. It's not a tractor driver who's gone a bit mad on this site. We've deliberately cut it to give it lots of aspects, lots of different variability in microhabitat to get as many invertebrate species in as we can. And Natural England, the government advisor on nature conservation, have surveyed these scrapes recently because they're some of the largest in the country. They found a whole range of species that they're incredibly excited about operating at this scale. This is just, again, showing some of that bare ground creation on site. And of course, something that, that Steve's been absolutely fundamental in is bringing back big herbivores back into Surrey. And these are just some of the examples of our Belter Galloways that have become pretty iconic throughout all of Surrey now. Uh, we have um, around 450 Belter Galloways that graze on sites from Box Hill out to Chobham Common and Ash Ranges, uh, working across all of those different areas to bring biodiversity back. This picture, as I get towards really talking about Perbright, shows you how much heathland we've lost. So everything in the light pink color was Heathland in 1800. And everything that's in the dark purple color is all that we have left now. So the area that we're really talking about tonight is Colony Bog and Bagshot, Bagshot Heath, that area right in the middle. But you've got ash ranges to the, to the south. You've got Chobham Common um, over to the um, northeast a little bit. Um, and then you've got Barossa or Sandhurst up the other side of the M3. You can really see if it wasn't for the army, we would have lost even more of this. The army were absolutely critical, um, inadvertently, in saving huge tracts of heathland. So all of that brings us to Purbright um, and this incredible wilderness area where people are not allowed to go and where the deer that we're going to talk about later on thrive. These are just a couple of pictures looking in. So one from above, trying to show you that it's this huge tract of, of land. And then a, a picture taken from the top of the, um, the butt, which stops the, the rifle bullets. So if you look um, on the aerial picture, um, you've got, how best to describe this? Can I use my cursor? I can. Here is where the picture on the right is taken from, looking out this way across the site. Um, and this shows you one of the bog systems. And if you ignore the pylons in the very far corner, there's actually not many signs of, of people in this. Yes, some of the ditches have been straightened and everything else, but actually what you're seeing is a really relatively untouched recently uh, Maya system, which has got some of these incredible rare species in. The problem we've got is that none of the management techniques, which I've just described, are available within Perbright. We can't take volunteers in there. We can't do controlled burning. We can't do bare ground creation. We can't put domestic livestock in there. We're not allowed to. And the reason is, is because the army have used it as a live training area 
for many, many years. And actually, we don't know exactly what's been fired in there. Um, so there are some reports about aircraft dropping munitions in there. We know that there have been mortars and grenades. Um, the tank hulk on the bottom, bottom left hand corner is one of the old targets that they used to fire at. So we know that there's a whole load of unexploded munitions in there. So how has it stayed as Heathland? Well, the answer is, is that every five to 10 years, the whole thing goes up in smoke, whether it's deliberate or whether it's accidental or whether it's from uh, military training activity, the whole thing starts to burn and it burns without being held back. Um, this is one of the, the last big fires in 2010 and the fire brigade are not allowed in there to put it out because of the unexploded munitions. So it's one of the largest wildfires that's allowed to burn without control, certainly in Southern England. Um, and what the, what the fire brigade do is camp around the outside of the site and put it out as it burns towards them. That causes a whole load of problems. Um, people have to be evacuated from their homes occasionally, all the military training comes to an end, um, and it really causes problems for the wildlife. So this is an aerial picture again, taken into the middle of the site in the last big fire. The site is 740 hectares in size within the fence, and it burnt 581 hectares of that. So a huge percentage of it. You can see there are some refuge areas where it didn't burn. You've got some areas of heath that have naturally gone out and the wet woodland on site has never burnt in memory. But it's really important that these refuge areas do still exist. And this again, just shows you the extent of the fire in 2010. So it's really good. It keeps the area as heathland. But if you look at this picture taken on the ground, you can see the problem. The fire nearly always comes around Easter, which is when the ground nesting birds have arrived. And unfortunately, their first broods are exterminated uh, in the fire. Um, and this is also the reason that we believe we don't have smooth snake on the site. When you look at the lack of cover, if the reptiles are able to survive the fire, they go underneath the ground and then as they emerge, they're picked off by predators. So this is not a sustainable long-term management technique for the species that we want to bring back in. So how on earth do you manage an area like this? This was the challenge facing a wide range of partners um, in, the, in the 2000s. We went to a whole load of work of commissioning literature reviews, looking at risk assessments, visiting other sites. We visited a whole range of deer sites around the country. We looked at what we could and couldn't do. We spoke to DEFRA. We spoke to a whole range of other people to see what the answer was. And we brought all of these different organizations together to get advice on what the best means of working was. Um, when we decided we were going to introduce animals into the area um, and, and they were going to be deer in a, in a park situation, we had to put in new fences. As much as there's a 14 kilometer long fence around the outside, we had to put in new fences internally as well. So you've got one of the MOD uh, bomb disposal experts on the left hand side using a, a very, very fancy, um, well, mine detector. Um, you can see he's wearing all of his protective kit with his wellies and um, sun hat and everything else. Um, and then what we did when we cleared those areas, we mowed those lines, we GPS them so that we knew exactly where we were gonna put in the fence posts. But to show you the risk that we were dealing with, these were things that were dug out by the bomb disposal experts on the fence lines. So you've got um, 3.5 inch rocket there, you've got some mortars, they found some grenades, a whole range of munitions were found and moved off the line so that we could put the right fences in the right place. It did involve going across some of the bog systems. This is a small amphibious vehicle that we used to bring the fence across one of the bogs. Um, this was supposed to be able to get through any landscape. It promptly sank the moment after this picture was taken and we had to bring in a, a big forestry tractor to pull it out. Um, so we really went through some interesting challenges to create the right line for holding the animals in this area. And this is what we achieved. Uh, we groundproofed um, over nine kilometers of existing fence. So that was so that the deer couldn't duck underneath the fence. Uh, the fence that goes around the outside stopping public access has 4.5 kilometers of, of basically razor wire sitting on top of it that needed raising so that the deer wouldn't get their antlers caught in it. And then the bits in green in this picture are new deer fencing that we had to put in place so that the deer couldn't access the army ranges. And we also had two refuge paddocks on the right hand excuse me, on the right hand side of the picture. So a huge amount of work went in to make sure that the deer would be safe, that they would have everything that they needed in terms of their uh, resources, in terms of shelter, in terms of water, in terms of their right food, 
everything they needed would be contained within this area. And that was absolutely critical that we researched all of that and then put in the right mechanisms before a single animal arrived on this site. So we did all of this in 2008 to 2010, uh, which is um, really the, the work that we did. And then we needed to make sure that we had the right equipment for one, being able to access the area and then being able to work in that area as well. So we bought this six by six Polaris, which has a lower ground pressure than a person's foot, which allowed us to move around the site in this vehicle. Um, so we, there's a very small number of us who are allowed to access the site on foot and with this vehicle. Um, the reason that public access was stopped in the 1970s is that unfortunately, um, a fair few um, scrap metal collectors went in to try and remove some of the tank hulks um, and unfortunately, some of them were killed uh, by the explosive munitions within them. And also some people took some of the unexploded munitions back home, uh, tampered with them, and they then blew up and, and killed them. Uh, so unfortunately, that meant that the army decided that public access into this area was not appropriate in the 1970s and put the fence in place, which was the, the last time that people were allowed into this area. So with all of this in place, the right fence, all of the right paperwork in place, the right vehicle, and a dedicated staff resource. And with all of the permissions in place, we went over to what Steve is gonna talk about. And I'm gonna try and give Steve consent to run the next part of the presentation. Thank you, James. There we go. Wonderful, so I should be able to... Excellent. Um, so yeah, thank you, James. So I was very, I was lucky enough to um, join Surrey Wildlife Trust in 2010 uh, to uh, take over the, the, the management of running of the Perfect Day project and all the hard work that James put in getting the project up and running and getting the infrastructure in place. Um, and I was lucky to join in September of that year, just at the point where the deer were going to be released onto the ranges. But I want to briefly touch on um, uh, the, the reasons behind um, the selection of red deer. Uh, why didn't we, or why didn't the Wildlife Trust use um, a roe deer or monk jack? So as many of you probably know, there's six species of deer in the UK. Uh, two of those are native, which are red deer and roe deer. And then there's four introduced species. Uh, starting with the smallest, you have, have the monk jack, um, you have the Chinese water deer, and you have fallow, and you have um, seeker. So uh, obviously when reintroducing the species into, into the UK, there's restrictions on that. And uh, we were restricted to um, either the, the two of the native um, animals that we have. And it's very much about the, the, the animal's ecology and how the animal has been adapted um, to that environment, which means it was able to deliver the ecological benefits on the site. Um, so selecting red deer, red deer in the, if you think of the six deer species, they are a mixed grazer and browser. So they take different amounts of grasses, they take, um, they browse on heather, they browse on gorse, and they, they graze on, uh, browse on trees as well. If you go to the other end of the spectrum, you have roe deer, who are what are called a concentrate selector. So many of you know if you're gardeners and you've had roe deer in your garden, you'll find the, the heads and the buds of your prize uh, flowers and your roses nipped off. So the option wasn't available because of what these different species here eat. We wouldn't have achieved the same effect on heathland if we just increased the native population of roe deer. So red deer were really the solution. Uh, in terms of sourcing the animals, we were reintroducing these animals onto a site. So animal health and welfare was paramount. So in selecting a herd locally from Warnham Deer Park, they had to have the facilities to blood test and uh, test the animals for TB. And this is uh, the um, project vet, Peter Green, Dr. Peter Green, at Warnham using specialist facilities uh, through a, a, a pneumatic crush to carry out TB testing on these on the red deer that were introduced. Um, at the start of the project, uh, the Wildlife Trust bought two stags, and you saw one in the previous picture, and 22 very enthusiastic hinds. Um, and these are the hinds exiting the, the trailer uh, back in, I think it was September of 2010. And the next slide, you can see the requirement for all of the fencing infrastructure work that James put in place. Um, deer can easily jump, you know, red deer can easily jump sort of 1.6, 1.8 meters. And they, you know, with sufficient motivation, they, they can clear fencing. So deer fencing is two meters high and you can see that hind is easily clearing 1.5 meters 
uh, out the back of that trailer. Um, so once you've identified the species which is going to deliver the ecological benefit on the site, uh, the, the next um, important uh, factor is figuring out how many of that species do you need to uh, deliver your objectives on the site. And the key part of that was uh, vegetation mapping. Um, so here we've got what's called a, a MVC, a National Vegetation Classification of the Purvoite Ranges. So here you can see the purple bits of the, of the bog systems. Um, and then you've got the yellows of the dry heath and the greens are, are the woodlands. And from this classification of the vegetation on the site, you then can use uh, calculations uh, for the conservation of these habitats to calculate the stocking rates. And what all these figures mean, you can see the, the different types of habitat down on the left hand side, is what it comes out with is a calculation of roughly 178 animals for the delivery of the conservation objectives of those habitats. Um, there's some caveats with that, with that target population of 178. These are, the, that's the maintenance stocking rate for, for those types of habitats. So if you wanted to adjust the, the, the objectives on the site, if you wanted to reduce go higher, then obviously you need to increase the populations. Or if you want to take the pressure off, you need to reduce the, the stocking rate and the density of population. Um, there's huge caveats with those calculations. Uh, there was plus or minus 40% depending on soil, uh, soil type, temperature and rainfall in the area. Um, so with that basis, we revised the initial target population to 160 adults um, to basically allow for the resident world population. And deer are notoriously difficult to count. They are very elusive and estimating population size, even in captive populations, is very, very difficult. So we had to allow uh, a, a margin of error in that calculation. Ultimately, these animals were introduced as an ecological tool. They are, they are meant to be on heathland. Uh, They're adapted to be on heathland. They're a woodland species. Uh, and we had ecolo ecological objectives for those animals on site and for the herd. And the stocking density was, we needed them to be slightly resource limited. So it pushed them onto some of the um, less palatable um, uh, vegetation. And we wanted to see that damage occurring on scrub and pine trees to stop that succession that James was talking about, to stop the site um, uh, or slow the, the reversion of the site into woodland over time. So the impact on pine, scrub and trees is, was essential. And then also we need to make sure we manage the density herd that it didn't get to a population that actually negatively impacted the, um, the, the specialist features of those heathland habitats, so the growth or regeneration of heather. But we wanted some grazing on there to create this mosaic of structure that didn't exist before. With the slide that James showed with that 570 hectares of fire, one of the problems with the sites is that the whole site regenerated at the same time and there was no structure and there was no diversity within those heather swords. So in the first few years after fire, it was ideally suited to some species like woodlark that love uh, short heather. Um, so you saw populations boom in sort of uh, the, the years three to five after a fire. But as the site began to get thicker vegetation, the, the habitat suitability would reduce for these species and you start to lose woodlark. Conversely, after a fire, the populations of dark warbler, warbler who like scrub levels disappeared and slowly started to recover as the scrub and some of the gorse came back. So, it's very important um, how we structured the herd. Uh, obviously, we've got uh, males and females. We had a breeding herd introduced. So we started off with that, those two stags and 24 hinds. You know, very, we're very interested on the ecological impact of the stags um, through their natural behavior of both breeding and uh, how they, they feed on the site. So uh, first and foremost, stags uh, in the herd disperse more widely across the site. Um, that's through uh, a number of reasons we'll talk about later, as they look for territories, as they compete with other males. So spreading that ecological impact across the site uh, was important to get to, to maximize the impact of the animals. And also the stags, because of that, had a great impact on some of the target vegetation through their behavior, so their ecological behavior. So they carried out something called fraying, um, which is the, uh, the, the rubbing of antlers on, on trees for territory marking. Um, they 
through temperature marking again, they create what are called deer wallows, um, where they scrape and they uh, lie in muddy pools, basically to, uh, for two reasons, one, to remove parasites, but also to send, basically use them as communication centers. Uh, they sent in them um, and to let other know stags that they've, that they've been there. That creates areas of bare ground. Also, the, the sparring and fighting between males, that level, creates levels of disturbance of vegetation as well, also opens up um, bare grounds. And the, the, the behaviour of the animals through different seasons, the overwinter in different areas, the hinds tend to hold up in the woodland with the good grazing, the stags tend to go to areas of deep heather uh, and brackened uh, areas of the, of the site. So it's really important, um, the, diff the impact that the different uh, males and females had on the site. So in terms of structuring the herd, uh, it is important that we each aim for, even though we start off with two, two stags and uh, 22 hinds, is that we aim for a one-to-one -one ratio of males to females in that herd. And from this graph, you can see hopefully how our herd has grown since 2010. So here we can see our two stags in blue, our 22 hinds, they gave birth to nine calves in the first year. And, and red deer are hugely successful um, breeders. They breed at about eight, with the, the mature hinds about 85% success rate, up into the 90% success rate if the conditions are favorable every year. So you can see the significant growth in the population um, all the way through till um, 2019 when we did our census. So we carry out a census in every March on these figures. And then you can see from here in, it was the 2017, uh, carving rate brought us up to our target population of 160. Um, so obviously, James mentioned before, this is a captive population. There's no migration naturally off the site. Um, so obviously there's an annual call to maintain the population at that 160 target population. And you can see also that at this point from obviously having a heavily dom uh, female dominated herd to start with, we have uh, in about 2018, we hit our 50-50 ratio of hinds to stags. Um, the interesting thing with um, deer that they're breeding their population control, the, the two main factors in the wild um, that control levels of population is not actually predators, it's food availability and exposure to, um, to uh, environmental conditions. So with red deer populations uh, in the wild, um, you get uh, their population is moderated by the breeding weight of females, whether they can make the weight uh, back into condition in the spring to actually breed successfully. And that's determined by food availability and also their ability to put on weight in the winter, the early parts of the summer and winter to allow them to survive the winter. Um, do you have ecological adaptations to, and a strategy to survive the winter? they basically reduce their energy expenditure uh, through the winter period and rely on their fat reserves to see them through. And they do that in a number of ways. They seek out really good shelter. They look for deep heather. They actually reduce their amount of feeding. But physiologically, they go through some changes as well. Their heart rate and their breathing rate actually slows down, so they expend less energy. And they convert, their, their, they convert uh, fat more readily to expend energy rather than digestion. So they almost go through a semi-hibernation period through the winter months, waiting uh, for that spring growth to come back um, and to start feeding in on grass. So with the reintroduction of red deer uh, and the, the hinds out on the site, you know, we were all eager to see whether, you know, the impacts and it, whether it would work. Uh, and some of the early impacts were uh, really reassuring. So this is bark stripping on Scots pine. Um, so this is the impact from deer, both hinds and stags can carry this out, um, where teeth, uh, the, the, the deer use their bottom uh, two teeth. They don't have any top teeth at the front. They have grinding teeth at the back and they use the bottom tree to strip off the bark and access the sugars as part of the forage. Roe deer will not do this. They, they will not access, um, they will not strip bark like this on, on small trees and saplings. And if you're out in the bed, you can tell it's characteristic uh, deer damage because you should be able to see the incised marks at the bottom where the bottom teeth strike in. Then it leaves, because they don't have any top teeth to snap it off. It leaves these longer strands at the top of the, 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 the small tree or sapling. And so that gives you an indicator that's bark stripping deer using their teeth on that. Now, that alone is perhaps unlikely to kill that tree immediately, but what it does, it opens that, it weakens that tree, it opens up to infection, uh, and also that tree goes larger, it's a weaker point in the tree, it might snap off. 
So it's slowing and uh, suppressing um, that growth of those more mature plants and established plants on the ranges. Other ecological impacts that we saw, this is what's called fraying damage. Uh, okay, so this is different to the, the, the bark stripping. This is territory marking by stags. So here you can see, you can't see any of those strips that have come off, but what you can see is damage up and down the uh, stem of the tree. You can see broken branches at the top and the bottom. Um, and this is stags moving around, uh, marking their territory. And this is the reason why deer antlers um, are the color that they are. Because deer antlers, I'm not sure if you're able to see this, are actually are made of bone. So quite a few might know that. And obviously bone like yours and eyes is white naturally. Okay, but whenever you see deer antlers or you collected them, they are brown um, on the surface. And this is staining from, from, stap, uh, from sap and dirt from all the territory marking uh, that they've carried out um, across the site. So this is where the stags are really, really important. So both the stags and the hinds can carry out damage by bark stripping. But obviously it's only the stags that's gonna carry out this, this fraying on, on these uh, larger trees. So obviously having a ratio of a significant proportion of stags means you're gonna get more damage on those trees. Um, so that's on the largest group. And then we're looking at where you got uh, pine seedling recruitment. Again, if you're out and about, and if you're looking at deer damage, you can see the characteristic uh, diagonal cut here, um, which indicates deer damage. So you've got the, uh, the bottom teeth incising here, and you can see they slope up to the top where it hits that hard uh, leathery palate at the top of the mouth. And what we discovered across the site is that, you know, as these pine, pine seedlings are uh, developing at this young age, the deer are coming along at the top of the heather and just nipping them off um, and just weakening them. So again, that's slowing the, the regeneration. And this is particularly through the winter, through the summer months and the spring when uh, all the grasses are really palatable and as abundance of food, they'll be mostly grazing on grasses. But as they push into those harsh, harsh winter months, there's less food availability and they'll start to select out uh, these saplings. Um, we, oops, excuse me, we've gone too quick. So we put some monitoring exclosures out um, after the fire in 2010. So this is a small area of heather um, that was fenced off. And you can see the impact that the deer are having on the regenerating heather um, in, the, in the fire burnt areas. So this is what I was talking about earlier, is that the, you know, without the deer grazing, these areas of heather would regenerate evenly and very quickly. Those opportunities, not only for species like woodlark would close up, but also the species that thrive on um, warmer soil temperatures, the invertebrates and some of the specialist plant species in there. But with the deer grazing on the regeneration, you can see they're not killing the plant, but what they're doing is slowing the speed of the reg regeneration and keeping these areas open in between the heather plants. And what they tend to do is take the, the center of the plant, which is quite nutritious, but then as other parts of the plants enable, enable the plant to survive and grow on. So that's what the, the browsing on heather regeneration looks like in, in a more open habitat. And you can see that they don't take everything. You know, the, the, the density of the population of the deer means that some plants are left and some plants are grazed down quite heavily. And then we start to develop this lovely structure um, within this regeneration that we never had before. And again, that provides uh, wonderful extended periods of habitat for species like the woodlark that depend on these open areas. There are the woodlark uh, feed on the ground, they hunt spiders. And so they require, rely on these open areas of heather habitat uh, to be able to hunt to feed their young. Other species that are reliant on uh, open areas of habitat, again, is the silver studded blue. Um, after the fire in 2010, we saw huge numbers um, across the site, clouds in, in that spring of 2000 or summer of 2011 on the, those short heather swords um, across the site. But again, without the deer browsing and keeping those areas of heather short, those areas would rapidly become unsuitable for the silver studded blue. This is a, a fascinating um, picture we stumbled across on one part of the site. Um, and it really sums up Per Bright in, in one photograph, really, and the history of what's happened at Per Bright in perhaps in the last 10 or 15 years. So here we have an area uh, of we have pine seedling regeneration, and we have some slightly more mature heather here. And what happened is that the fire in 2010 burned up to this edge. 
and you can see it burnt and it stopped for whatever reason, the wind direction changed uh, and it wiped out all the pine seedlings in this area. Um, these seedlings obviously coming from this parent tree over here and you can see quite there's a large amount of recruitment um, on the ground. Um, what's happened since 2010, obviously this area heather has regenerated, but also within this area, obviously it's very obvious there's zero pine seedling recruitment um, in this regenerating area, which this picture was taken about seven or eight years later. So anecdotally, what you can see from this is actually that this, this parent tree is not been able to get any pine seedlings to, re, to successfully germinate here, or if they are, they're being grazed off by the deer as they're coming out of this woodland. And you can see how much shorter this heather habitat is. So this is a big success indicator really, is that showing that the deer is stopping in some areas, the, the recruitment of pine seedlings to stop the areas uh, scrubbing up. Um, and then birch is a, a favourite for the deer in spring and, and late autumn. So again, uh, regenerating birch, if many of you volunteer with the Wildlife Trust has had many a happy era, either cutting down birch or, um, or pined on, on these he uh, heathland sites. And you can see, you know, there's a big impact on, on the birch here, um, stripping off uh, selectively a lot of those leaves. And it's, it's a nutritional um, impact on these birch trees. They, they're not killed instantly. But again, they're not being um, given the opportunity to produce seeds, and you know it, there's a net energy loss. So there's slowly uh, as the leaves are stripped away. Uh, and this is what I'm particularly excited about, and I always go on about, is the the fact that dwarf shrubs like gorse and heather are have designed over hundreds of thousands of years to be browsed and grazed annually by um, browsing species of herbivores. And connected to that, other species such as Dartford warbler have then used those ecological impacts as part of their um, ecological survival traits. So Dartford's particularly looked over winter in dense uh, gorse bushes. Uh, they provide a great amount of shelter, they provide warmth, they quite often these dense gorse bushes will provide um, some invertebrate life through the winter months. And they allow the Dartford to also to shelter and survive from heavy snowfall as well. And in Surrey, I think, comparing some of the other heathland sites, um, you know, the, the structure of gorse on perbite has changed significantly compared to somewhere where you don't have deer browsing. So what deer do is that they don't go for the really thorny stuff. Basically, they take off the soft annual growth at the tips of the gorse bush. And basically, it toperies the bush. It changes the structure of the bush. So if you go to Chobham Common, you find a lot of gorse bushes that go really quick and really leggy um, and because they, they haven't been browsed. And they don't provide the same ecological benefits to those other species as a, a gorse bush, which is being browsed annually um, by deer. The other things that James was talking about in terms of the management we do on other sites, are that bare ground creation, where we use tractors or we use volunteers for to create those um, areas of bare ground that invertebrates rely on. Um, so this is something that never existed before. The red deer were introduced in 2010 is deer tracks across the site. And these are natural features, and this is how bare ground would have um, naturally occurred within um, the heathland habitats as large grazing herbivores travel across. You get these lovely meandering tracks, you get water flowing over these tracks which washes off the surface soil, which then exposes sand underneath, which then provides habitat for solitary wasps, bees, uh, dung beetles, um, and all of that happens naturally across there. And there are now hundreds of these deer tracks existing across the regenerating site, which didn't occur before. Um, the other thing that it does is then provide hundreds and hundreds of mini fire breaks across the site. So one of the hopes, thankfully, since 2010, we've not had another fire on the site. Um, but again, we then have hundreds of these tracks across the site, which, you know, provide multiple opportunities if there's a change in wind direction or slowing down of the fire for the fire to actually be extinguished at these points. So you, you're putting in some natural fire resilience into the site, as well as the deer, grazing on the regenerating heather and, and reducing the, the fuel burden of the vegetation and the material on the site. So one of the key impacts of the deer grazing on the site we, is that we hope that any, if we're unlucky enough to have future impacts of fire, is that the impact is reduced and instead of getting 540 hectares burnt, then maybe we'll only have maybe 54 hectares burnt as the, the fire is stopped in certain areas. Um, and these areas, as James mentioned before, are fantastic for invertebrates, you know, specialists like the heath tiger beetle that we do have on perbite that rely on these open areas um, to hunt. 
and areas for dung beetles as well. So stags again, they, you know, they push into huge areas of scrub, they create that level of structure. This is one of the original stags um, we bought from uh, Warnham. You can see he came with an ear tag for transport and the first number denotes the year he was born, which is 2007. And you know the versatility of deer as well to create structure, uh, you know, able to get onto their back legs to either push down birch trees or to browse lines of, of regenerating trees on the side. Um, we're lucky enough to be able to invest in some GPS collars and have those fitted at Warnham, so we're able to monitor uh, the site usage and by, uh, by the animals. So here we have a GPS collar and a battery which is fitted to this, this stag. And that provided some fascinating information about how the animals spend their time across the site. And if you think back to those maps, um, these are the, perhaps the sensitive bog systems through the center where you find some more of the sensitive plant species, the orchids. And then we've got, um, you can see the dry areas where the, the animals spend quite a bit of the time, but then they transition across these bog areas. So what you're finding is where you're getting heavy areas of scrub and woodland, the deer are concentrating their efforts naturally but perhaps in some of the more open heathland areas, they are transitioning through and doing occasional browsing and light, more sensitive browsing in these, these places. So, and we get different behaviors depending on the different sexes. So you can see here for a, the previous slide was for a hind for 12 months. This is one of the stags. And also you can see the impact here is on the east. This is one of the rutting grounds that they, this, they developed on the site. And obviously the, the, the stags then spend a large amount of their time holding these rooting gowns in the woodlands and you get variations in the ecological impacts depending on their behaviour. Um, fitting the GPS collars, this is the, the project's vets, Peter Green again. Um, we had some, we got some paddocks in the east that we were able to dart the deer in and tranquilise um, animals that we want to fit GPS collars to. So this is a stag after he's actually had a tranquiliser dart fired into his bottom. You can see he's quite unperturbed by that and more interested in the, the, the food I put down for him. But after a little while, um, he starts to feel perhaps a little bit sleepy. Uh, and as long as the vet has got the, level, the dosage of the tranquilizer uh, correct, then we, with some confidence, we then can uh, um, work on the animals and fit the GPS collars to them for tracking. Um, and this video, if it plays, though it doesn't look like it wants to, yeah is one of the deer that has been given the antidote and is waking up as he comes around and he doesn't always run in the direction you expect them to as he ran towards us rather than directly away from us um, and when they have that set of antlers on them that can be a bit intimidating. Um, we were very lucky enough to have a undergrad uh, vet student at the University of Surrey, uh, of Surrey that took some of this information uh, and this GPS information and did a um, a thesis looking at how the animals were behaving on the site and what was driving them. Um, and there's a lot of information here, but basically uh, males are in orange, females are in uh, yellow. And basically she, she took that MBC data um, that we had and analyzed where the deer were spending their time. And you can see huge variations here between males and females uh, and where they're, where they're spending their time. So both um, sexes are spending a lot of time on, on the heathland, which is excellent. Uh, but here we can see a huge amount for males in bracken woodland spending a lot of time there. And that's probably for two reasons. One is probably that um, a lot of the rutting ground is, is in bracken woodland through that period, but also they've got a different overwintering strategy to females. So they're probably spending a lot of their winter in bracken woodland for shelter. But it was a fascinating study. It allowed us to compare what, how our animals are behaving naturally to other studies um, and to see their, 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 their impacts on the site. So from the study, there's some several conclusions, um, you know, which lined up with previous deer research that males and females spent the majority of their year in single sex herds, and they're distinct with non-overlapping ranges apart from a few times. Uh, the females are followed by the males into the rutting range, and then the, this wonderful phrase, both sexes experience a degree of temporal, stabiliz temporal stabilization within this range. They stay in the same place for a bit. Um, but this is the most important bit, I think, is that migration motivation. And it is a small scale ecosystem, as James showed on his previous slides, you know, the extent of heathland, how these animals used to move across tens of thousands of hectares rather than 740, is that these animals are motivated by their, their sexual selection pressures and you know, the natural pressures of climate and food availability. 
So in 2016, um, we had a vegetation resurvey. The, the, the whole site was baselined uh, in before the deer were released, I think in 2009, before um, the fire occurred. And from that survey, the ecologist um, came up with this, that basically the impacts of the deer browsing and trampling had almost universally been positive across the site. Um, There's significant increase, increases in certain species, uh, such as lichens, and there's decreases in some of the negative indication species of bracken and scrub. Um, you know, again, some of those heath and specialist uh, species, such as sphagnum uh, moss and some of the rain leaf sundew, had increased significantly. Um, but, you know, and then there's increase in species diversity and positive increases in the valley mire and those specialist bog systems across the site. Um, further monitoring was required. There was, uh, as always, whenever you introduce a species, there's always going to be some negative impacts on there. Part of that was somewhere the deer cross the bog systems, they do create trampling and on some small scales had some negative impacts on some of the sphagnum within those bog systems. Then actually also, although we haven't monitored it, we have noticed in the broadleaf woodland that a lot of the understory, because deer of that woodland species, has been browsed off and the canopy is now a lot more open within those woodland areas than it was beforehand. Um, in shortly after that, Natural England came out and did an assessment of the SSSI conditions, sites of special scientific interest. And again, their report was excellent um, that they found that the, the, the different habitats of dry heath, wet heath, and mire all met the targets for habitat condition. They assessed that the, the, the scrub levels appeared under control of pine, birch, and gorse. And then you know, again, really importantly, I think, is that the, the grazing and browsing is producing this high structural diversity in the in the dwarf shrub species of heather and gorse on there. And, and this was backed up by the monitoring of the of the, the grain nesting bird species of those Dartford warblers, the woodlark and the night jail on the site, which shows stable populations. Uh, and they turned the whole site into favorable condition um, from the previous condition of unfavorable recovering in 2016. Um, in summary, you know, the, you know, we can, from both the evidence of the, uh, the vegetation remonitoring, the uh, natural England assessment, and our own monitoring of the health and well-being of the herd, we can show that the, the reintroduction of red deer can improve the ecology of, of heathland habitat um, when managed correctly. But to maximise those benefits, a, a balanced herd structure is really necessary uh, on the site. And also, most importantly, we can maintain um, the welfare of the herd uh, at a balanced herd structure within that 50-50 sex ratio. And just to finish off, there's a video of James and another James Herd releasing one of the, those stags back in 2010 onto the site. Have to excuse me. Excuse me, my uh, my internet's a bit slow. I think I've got control again, Steve. Okay. So um, Steve's kind of outlined where you know how the deer arrived on site, what we did with it, and so here we are, um, ten years later on. The the anniversary of opening the gates to release the deer out onto the wider area was the fifteenth of November. Um, so it's been 10 years, uh, almost you know, to the day, since we released these animals. And um, we really have shown that the right grazing in the right place is an incredibly empower, powerful management tool, especially on sites that are as complicated and big as this. And it's not just in Surrey that those um, learning experiences have been welcomed. Uh, this is a group of German uh, foresters who've come over who manage um, huge areas over in Germany and they've come out with um, the British Armed Forces to look at how we manage their nature reserves from a nature conservation point of view and integrate military training and wildlife on the same areas. So it's, it's really reaching an international audience to the extent that Steve and I were contacted um, earlier this year by um, a group called the Brandenburg For Foundation who are taking over very large ex army areas in Germany um, to we're talking about this area here which is on the, the Polish-German border. It's 55,000 hectares in size. 
and it's absolutely enormous and it's forming a wildlife corridor which is allowing species to move from Poland in terms of this big rewilding operation coming through the center of Europe and already on site they have um, a pack of wolves, they've got otters, they've got um, boreal owl, they've got um, bison, they've got a whole range of things coming back in and they've invited Steve and I and a couple of our colleagues to go over um, and form a, an international foundation with them in partnership where we can all share knowledge about how to rewild and reconnect these huge landscapes uh, and bring best practice together um, and all of that has come out of the work that we've done here in Surrey. So we really have managed to create something that's going to protect you know, this incredible site and could have um, impacts elsewhere, not just now, but for generations to come. It really is an incredible management tool um, that we're very, very proud of. So to finish, just before we answer some of your questions, we're just going to um, play a couple of videos um, just so you can really actually see a real sense of some of these animals. And Steve, feel free to chip in to describe what's happening here. Yeah, so obviously this is a, a a, a mature stag in the in the, one of the rutting grounds. Um, in when you're aging deer, you can only really group them into sort of into calves, juvenile, mature stags at sort of three to nine years old, and then older stags kind of thing. So you can see this stag's got a big mane. He's got great body condition. Um, uh, he's got a widespread of antlers. You need lots of indications of of um, body condition and antlers. This is a juvenile, so I'd put this animal at probably either two or three years old. You can see he's a lot thinner, his body's less developed, he has no mane, and these antlers are a lot thinner, you know, and then here's the, the, the dominant stag that's holding the rutting grain in the background, okay? Again, bigger body condition, mane, wider, thicker antler spread, uh, lots of points, and then again, there's another young sort of interloper juvenile in the back, and you know this stag is constantly shouting and and trying to push these juveniles away uh, or younger stags who are trying to um, uh, steal these hinds away. And this is actually another two uh, fairly juvenile stags, maybe sort of four four year olds, five year olds. This is not actually a rut. This is in the deer paddocks, and I'd actually put some food down um, to uh, some of the deer, and they're basically fighting. So there's the mature stag in the front, and these guys are just uh, fighting over. Um, social position effectively. So the fighting over the food and the fighting over their, their social position in the, the herd. Uh, and you can see actually what it is, they're not looking to herd each other, it's a wrestling match. And so, um, yeah, this guy obviously won and uh, once he'd gained dominance over the other one, the other one retreated before he could become injured. And that's what antlers are designed to do. They're designed to wrestle and to exert dominance within, within the, the breeding herds uh, and obviously then defend from predators. And you could obviously hear in the background of that um, video as well, the, the uninterrupted military training and civilian target shooting that goes on as well. So that's the end of, of our presentation on, on one of the absolute you know, wildlife havens in Southern England. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed listening to us. Thank you for, for giving up your, your Thursday evening to listen to us. It's one of the projects that we are most proud of in Surrey Wildlife Trust. Um, we will happily try and answer as many of your questions for the next 20 minutes or so. I think Sophie's gonna help bring those out to us. Um, but thank you so much for coming out. Thank you, Sophie, for, for everything you've done. Um, and let's see if we can answer some questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, James and Steve. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I just uh, love hearing about that project. It's just brilliant. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, uh, first question is um, from uh, Mr. Scott. Uh, in order to see the red deer in their location, uh, oh, sorry, is there a location, time of day, or season to best see them from the boundary fence? That's a really good question. So let, let's start with that. With, with that, what we'd rather you didn't do. We'd <laughs> rather you didn't take bags of carrots and try and feed them through the fence. Um, we don't think people are doing it at that moment, and, and please don't do that. Um, you will see the deer occasionally uh, from the fence, um, especially the, the, the boundary fence that runs along the, um, the western side of the site. Um, the best time really, if you want to hear them, which is the, almost the most evocative thing, is to go out in, in well it's October isn't it Steve? Um, you know, and, of, October. Yeah, to, to hear, hear the rut um, and obviously that can help kind of guide you a little bit. And the best place probably to do that, for those of you who know the area well, is the gate outside Grey Spot Grenade Range um, on Brentmore Heath. If you walk there and listen out carefully, and it, again, it does happen all the way through the day, but 
in my experience, seems to be a little bit more in the morning and the evening. Um, if you walk up and down, you'll hear them. And then if you stand with a pair of binoculars, you might be lucky enough to see some. Brilliant. Thank you very much, James. Uh, we have uh, quite a few questions coming in now, which is great. Thank you all very much. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, 2020 has been a bad year for fires on Heathland. Uh, what can be done to reduce this risk in the future? Solve climate change, uh, fundamentally. Uh, you know, that's unfortunately one of the big issues that, that's that's driving wildfires up. And you think about the weather that we've had this year, it's been ex it was exceptionally wet and then it was an exceptionally dry year. What it did was dried all of the moisture out of the vegetation and out of the soil, created the perfect conditions. And that, you know, the very now famous Chobham fire, um, the temperature was 37 degrees centigrade. You know, the, it was incredibly hot. So we can do things like fire breaks and that has stopped fires burning into Perbright. So there was a fire just outside the ranges this year but the fire breaks outside are now so good that the fire brigade were able to stop it jumping into the range. But really all of the Heathland fires that we're talking about are unfortunately created by people, um, either accidentally or deliberately. So it is about us being responsible. Don't have a barbecue on a Heathland site. Be careful about cigarettes and where you put them out. Please don't have campfires, anything like that. That's the way we can all make a difference. Brilliant, thank you, James. Um, is there a risk? I think I feel this is a Steve Proud um, question. Um, is there a risk of interbreeding for red deer? Um, there, obviously, the, because we started off with uh, a population, the, the original animals were chosen for their diverse bloodlines because we bought them from a deer park. They had those records. But when you talk to deer vets and deer ecologists, actually, because deer haven't been domesticated, they haven't been bred through that funnel of domestication that we have for our domestic cattle or you know or pets or anything so actually the, the, the genetic pool for deer is quite wide um, so we consulted the vet and you know he reassures that there, there's no risk uh, of, of um, you know genetic problems from from inbreeding um, because of that genetic pool so yeah they should be fine. Brilliant thank you Steve. Um, uh, comment from uh, one of our members. Um, absolutely brilliant, guys. Thank you. Learned so much. How cool if it would get some live cams on the Heath and even from Germany. Mm. That's the, the next project to uh, do. <laughs> power out there would be tricky, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a long extension cable. Steve's got some great, actually, we should have put it on. Steve's got some great trail camera footage. Um, and actually, we should put some of that up at some stage. Um, so we'll see what we can do. And actually, Steve and I have, have been um, have accidentally ended up triggering some of the camera traps ourselves. So unfortunately, there's some very boring footage of us walking through. Brilliant. Well, I look forward to seeing that footage. Um, I'm sure our social media team would be very excited to have that. They're always after footage. Um, uh, next question is, are there wild red deer in Thames Basin Heath area? In a short answer, no. Um, the only red deer that I've been aware, wild red deer in Surrey that I'm aware of, I've seen pictures of some over towards Dorking, um, and there will be escapees from private deer parks. So there are, there are, as far as I'm aware, there's no wild red deer, but there are, I have seen evidence of small herds in the county, which will be yeah, deer escaping from, from jumping fences or, or getting out, especially through, through the rutting season as the, uh, yeah, the males get uh, motivated. Wonderful. Um, and uh, another question, are there any, many roe deer left on the site? Yeah, there's a, a very good healthy population of roe deer still within there because the, um, th th there's no competition really between roe deer. Roe deer and red deer eat very different things and behave in very different ways. Uh, roe are, are pretty much solitary territorial animals with small family groups and, and red are big herding animals. And I've seen the roe with in the, in, with the red deer on the, the site many times. Um, so yeah, good populations. And uh, roe deer having twins, which is also a very good indication that they're, they're very happy and have good food availability. Wonderful. Um, right, a couple more questions coming in. So if anyone would like to ask some more questions, please do um, use the uh, Q&A function. Um, I noticed there is a question on the chat as well, um, but just get your questions to us. This is great. Um, Right, next question is, can will red deer coexist with the Belties? Oh, that's a good question. Steve, do you want to you do that one? I mean, I mean, that is a great question because that is the, the dream for us because 
the, the two animals are complementary and, and deliver two different um, ecological benefits. So, you know, the, the red deer is that grazer browser, they're all year round, really attacking the scrub, changing the, scrub, uh, the structure of dwarf shrubs. And the bell team is a grazer, it is a non selective um, grazer, it really takes bulk and volume of those coarse grasses as well. And, you know, if you want to go back thousands of years to look at our, you know, the base of our ecology, you would have had red deer, roe deer, and oryx, which is the, the, the precursor to the domestic cattle, shaping and maintaining our habitats. And, and those two animals, you know, as grazing animals are hugely complementary. And having those two work in unison, if we could manage it, would be fantastic. And, and what, what that question absolutely refers to and what Steve has just described. Oh, Sophie's gone. So uh, it looks like we're going to be asking our own questions. Um, I think our internet must have just pinged out. Um, what, what's just been described there is some of the, the talk around rewilding projects in the country. And, and obviously the most famous of those is, is NEP, uh, which many of you will have heard of. And they've reintroduced red deer there. Um, they've also got fallow deer there too. Um, Steve might want to say a little bit about fallow deer and what they bring to a landscape. But they've also brought in longhorn cattle uh, and pigs. So they've tried to create all of those ecological drivers uh, and they're bringing beavers in as well at the moment, a whole range of different species back in. You might notice that Steve and I have been a little bit careful about using the word rewilding. We actually haven't really discussed that today and, and Steve's been more open than that and described the deer as a management tool. Um, it, is a, it is kind of a rewilding project, but it's a Heathen site and we, are, we do have an aim for what it needs to be. Often in rewilding projects, you don't have an aim. You allow natural processes to exist and then have something that comes out of that, whatever nature decides it will be. So that's that's the interesting thing with us on this project, because it's an internationally European protected wildlife site, it has to be Heathland, and we've designed the management technique to achieve that long term. But it's it's something that we are actively looking in at, at where we might be able to graze our Galloways and deer together. All right, Steve, let's see if I can make this work. I've never had to be host at the same time. Um, Okay, uh, let's do this one. Is there any evidence of deer being shot uh, by the NRA or army? Uh, no, is the uh, long and short of it. The, the, the really good uh, advantage of having a, um, a, a, a confined uh, a site with no migration and knowing what your starting population is, is that for the, at least for the first five years, I was able to accurately count uh, carving rates, adults, I knew exactly what was on site. Obviously, once the population got beyond, I think it was maybe 100, 110, then obviously it got much, much trickier to count every calf that was born. But for the first five years, I was able to, um, yeah, uh, know exactly what had been born uh, and what the um, mortality rate was. And actually, we, we had population modeling, and we do have a population model. We built in uh, natural mortality for, um, for the adults and for the calves. And actually we've had to reduce that to zero um, because the, what we found is that the census, we're, we're just getting zero mortality and we're actually underestimating the populations. So yes, excellent population growth and zero mortality uh, nearly on the side. And, and someone's followed it up with another question of are the deer in danger from hidden explosives? Uh, no, because um, again, with the, the uh, army risk assessment, I mean, the, the several points that one, we've, the army permits us to go out on on the ranges on foot and with the ATV. So I'd hope you know uh, uh, they value us just as much as the deer. But also, the, I can't remember when, when do they stop firing munitions in the 1980s out there. Yeah. And so, unless you're doing some serious ground disturbance, mechanical ground disturbance, big machinery, throwing rocks at stuff, you know, uh, there is there's no, I think there's no no risk of, of that on that side. Good. All right. Um... Someone's asked, um, say the roe have twins, do red deer ever have twins? Very occasionally, but not very often. So roe will have twins every year if, uh, will more than likely have uh, uh, twins every year if they reach good, reach good body condition. So it's a really good indication that the roe are doing very well and the habitat suitable. Reds will very occasionally have um, twins and I've not seen any evidence of them having um, it's like in that Belty Galloway herd, we've only had twins once in, in 12 years. Um, we've had another question here about has the release site success been helped by its size? I, I think that's a, that's a really good question. Um, the simple answer is, is yes. 
um, we, we couldn't introduce a herd of, of red deer to some of our small heathland sites, you know, uh, you know, some of them are 10, 15 hectares in size, that they're just not big enough to sustain the population that, we, that we'd need. So absolutely the size of perbrite, the scale is fantastic. Um, and I can actually suck up one of the other questions in here as well is, you know, around large scale rewilding projects likely in Surrey. Um, yes, I mean, you know, clearly there are other big MOD sites, but they do have public access onto them. So it's things that we need to reconsider in all of the different elements coming together. Uh, and someone's asked, uh, are beaver introductions being considered in the county? And the National Trust already have a license, I believe, down further south in the county to introduce beavers into an enclosure. And most of the releases at the moment are into enclosures. Um, it's still not general practice that you can release animals into the wider landscape without a whole load of checks and balances in place. Right, um, Steve, does the trust sell the venison it culls and all the antlers? Yep, so the uh, the venison does go to a game dealer, so it's a byproduct of the project, so you know, very good that we can return that into the food chain. Uh, it, we don't sell it directly or locally, uh, it goes to the wholesaler um, uh, for, for handling, so yeah. Good. Um, do we, does, do the MOD pay us? Um, that's an interesting question. No, they don't. Uh, the MOD don't, don't pay uh, the Wildlife Trust um, a penny uh, for this. Um, the money comes from, this is a very pertinent question, the money comes from uh, countryside stewardship agreements, which is, um, I'll, I'll answer this briefly, the common agriculture policy, which is the agriculture policy across all of Europe, had two pillars, the basic payment scheme, which is the subsidy, and an environmental scheme, which was countryside stewardship. Um, the British government have committed to keep countryside stewardship until 2024, and they're bringing in a new environmental land management scheme. And the policy was released for that on Monday uh, this week. <clears throat> so we're just beginning to find out what that looks like in a post-EU world. Um, and that's a very uh, serious question for us, looking at what funding is available in the future. Um, all right. Do you have to clear carcasses or are they ever left for natural disposal? Um, so, yep, occasionally there, there's, um, we have left carcasses uh, for natural disposal um, if, uh, because of our bog system. So if there's a, a, an animal that can't be retrieved due to safety, um, so yeah, they're left. And yeah, there is obviously for not only for scavengers, but there's, um, uh, there's fungi and there's uh, invertebrates that love uh, decaying carcasses and especially large decaying carcasses that provides a, a, a different aspect to the habitat which you know didn't exist before so yes so um, gralic and carcasses are, are occasionally left on the side do you just want to explain what gralic is um yeah so obviously when i do is called that they they they'd leave the um uh, the base of the, the, the guts in the inside on the site uh, and then take the, the, the rest of the carcass away. But again, by leaving that on site, that's available for, for other predators, scavengers and, and invertebrates on, on there. Um, so this is a really good question. If the site does catch fire again, is there a strategy in place to ensure the welfare of the deer? Yeah. Um, so that was the work that you, well, James did very early on uh, in the, uh, and also all the partners, the project partners, the ISPCA, the Deer Initiative, uh, the British Deer Society, you know, looking at the welfare. So we looked, uh, or James looked at the, the history of the site, the mapping of where the area is burnt, and we have two paddocks in the, the east of the, the site, um, which are grass fields effectively, which have, uh, have gates, the deer use them a lot, and those don't burn, so there'll be refuge areas. Uh, and also the, the MOD has um, cleared this uh, 10 meter fire break around the perimeter, uh, which is maintained around the fence line. And uh, so we have a, a, a fire action plan that, you know, an event of a, a widespread wildfire, we mobilize members of staff, we have people monitoring the, the fence lines. We hope that the deer will then locate and use the, the refuge areas, which are be well away from the fire, and then we'd monitor um, the, the fire breaks along the fence lines. And, the long and short of it is, is, is that we, if we think there's a, a risk to animal welfare or, or the deer are going to risk of becoming trapped, we'll open one of the external gates and, and let them out. Good. Um, this is a, a really interesting question, uh, which I, I guess I'll have a stab at. Um, it says, I'm wondering why people are so damaging to Heathland when the deer roaming aids the habitat. So, you know, why are people damaging and deer aren't? Is it because people often have dogs which disturb the wildlife? Um, the simple answer is yes, but obviously people do a whole range of other things as well. They, they leave litter, they set fire to the site, their dogs chase wildlife, 
Um, and obviously dogs are a predator species, whereas the, the deer are, are a, a herbivore. Uh, so you can often see a deer browsing a gorse bush and a Dartford warbler will be sitting on the other side of it. Whereas if a dog is there chasing around, running around and around, uh, you're creating all of those problems. On top of which, we don't use any inputs onto our deer at all. Obviously, they're completely natural. If you think about the dogs that are going into most of our heathland sites, they've often got internal wormers that have been put inside them. Um, so that causes problems when the dog mess is left on site. It means the dung beetles eat those um, dog mess and then unfortunately they die. Um, on top of which, a lot of dogs are covered in tick treatments. They then go into water courses, and there was a paper released on this last week, which is causing all sorts of problems to our aquatic invertebrates. So there's a whole range of different things that happen on the open heathen sites, which is why they look so different uh, from, from perbrite. But the, the deer are there as a natural part of the ecosystem, and they're there 24-7, they make their natural decisions. And, and this is why they're such an incredible um, management tool for the sites. But it's a really good question. Right. Here we go. Oh, oh, oh right. Um, <laughs> does this site favour raptors or cuckoos where compared to the other heaths? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the simple answer is yes, but maybe. Uh, the, the problem often on Perbright is actually getting out there to monitor it uh, because of the amount of firing that takes place. Um, so Steve and I do, do nearly all of the, the, the monitoring our, ourselves. Um, we have had some incredible species out there, as I described, you know, overwintering great grey shrike, but you do get those occasionally on ash. You do get them on Thursday Common, which naturally England managed further south in the county. Um, it does still hold a good population of cuckoos, but you can see cuckoos on Chobham and ash as well. And unfortunately, they're struggling across the country. Um, but what it really does have is that lack of disturbance. And that's why the nightjar population, it's why the Dartford warbler population, it's why the woodlark population do well out there because it's just this huge tract of completely undisturbed land. And so it, 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 it has a very good population than many of the other uh, sites. As someone who lives very near the site, I've noticed red kites and parakeets in the area recently. Will these have any impact on the other wildlife? Parakeets, um, possibly, um, although it's recently been relatively debunked that parakeets were impacting on nesting birds by taking over um, holes in trees. Um, there's, a lot, there's still quite a lot of discussion about that. What they are a problem for are vineyards um, and some other horticulture, because they will go, will go through and decimate those areas. Red kites, absolutely not. Red kites are a natural part of our ecosystem. Uh, they will be feeding on the growlick that Steve has des described, um, as well as uh, the, the increasing buzzard population, which is growing again following DDT being banned and a lack of persecution across the country. Welcome red kites back. They are a fantastic species and a sign that maybe some of our other species are just about hanging on in there. Uh, what? Right, a coffee morning on the new agriculture bill. <laughs> I think that's, yeah, no, that's entirely true. Um, the, the question is, there's a new agriculture act now. It's gone from being a bill into an act um, and how the new money's coming in would be brilliant to inform members. What you might want to do actually is that we, um, this Wildlife Trust centrally held a, um, a forum last night, which involved the National Farmers Union, DEFRA, um, the Wildlife Trusts, um, Sustain uh, and um, a cereal farmer. Um, and you can find that on their, their YouTube channel. Um, and I'd really recommend that. Um, all of the, the present knowledge on that was put out there as well um, to be described. Uh, so I'd recommend that's the first port of call, but Sophie, maybe that's something we want to think about in the future. Um, Definitely, we'll look into it. Thank you very much. Okay. And I guess we're kind of coming towards the, the end there, Sophie. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, apologies for my internet going down. Um, very timely at the end. Um, I do apologize if there was any disruption, but thank you very much, James, for taking over the hosting and questions um, so beautifully. That's right. um, I don't usually get to ask so, <laughs> so, so much and him have to answer them, so it was brilliant. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm glad it worked out for you both. Um, uh, we've got a few comments saying um, thank you very much for a fascinating talk, um, Steve and James. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and again, um, Paul made a suggestion for the um, contents of a potential coffee morning. Um, we are running members' coffee mornings and we are increasing our online talks. 
Um, so we would love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on particular subjects that you'd like a really in-depth look at um, in one of our evening talks, or if you just like um, a particular subject for a sort of informal chat um, over virtual coffee these days, um, do please email me um, either at events at Surrey um, WT or um, the org.uk or um, sophie.code. Um, I'm sure you've probably got my email address from um, the hundreds of Eventbrite emails you get from us. Um, thank you all for coming and uh, for those that have made a donation tonight uh, to be here, thank you so Oh, um, it means really so much um, to continue our work. Um, and I'm freezing again, aren't I? <laughs> well, you're back and we heard everything. Oh, good, good. I don't need to repeat myself. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much for your support. If you're a volunteer or a member or just a wildlife enthusiast. Um, and if you're not a member, um, consider signing up. Um, do get in touch with any ideas for future events. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. Have the rest, rest of your evening and enjoy. Bye. <laughs>